Thanks for taking time to watch this video presentation. Higher interest rates and unsettled markets have meant opportunities have merged in the real estate market. In this video, I'd like to explain some of the ways that you can take advantage of those opportunities. The video is roughly 15 minutes long and it comes in four parts. Should I present too slowly, you can fast forward. Should I present too quickly, you can slow down and review. Either way, I promise I won't be offended. Just before we begin, here's a word from our sponsors in the compliance and the legal departments. This presentation is produced and published on and around July 4th, 2022. It includes timely information that can be quickly rendered obsolete and it is meant for information purposes only. This is not an offer to purchase securities and no representation is made. Items presented may not be suitable for everyone, rates change, values fluctuate, and I'm not even kidding. Please consult an experienced qualified licensed professional prior to investing to ensure that your investments are a part of a comprehensive plan designed to help you and your family meet your long-term goals and objectives. Also, when recommending products and planning strategies, broad tax and legal issues may be discussed. Nothing should be construed as tax or legal advice. There, now that we got all the cheese between the crackers, let's forge ahead. Here's our agenda. Number one, we're going to look at what a REIT actually is, how it's structured and what advantages they have for investors. Number two, we'll look at some administrative principles, some of the potential partners and some of the prospective part, uh, properties that you might own. And number three, we'll review why a person would want to hold these properties in an annuity contract. And number four, we'll explore some of the advantages to borrowing against the contract. Here's a bit of background on real estate investment trusts or REITs as they're known. And yes, that's me on the corner of Young and Eglinton doing a little bit of due diligence on Rio Can. In 1990, the federal government allowed the creation of REITs so smaller investors could realize the benefits of owning real estate alongside institutional investors. The trusts are structured much like partnerships might be structured. So they don't pay taxes like a corporation would. Instead, their distributions uh, maintain their character and unit holders are taxed uh, at their own uh, marginal tax rates. Think of a REIT as a partnership with millions of partners. By investing in a REIT, a unit holder obtains an interest in some premium real estate, properties that are often located in Canadian city centers, urban hubs, and along transit corridors, properties that normally wouldn't be accessible to smaller investors. REITs have economies of scale and they're able to employ real estate professionals to work with urban planning departments on developments and zoning bylaws, etc. They have easier access to capital and they can usually borrow at the best market rates. Their debt is typically staggered, so interest rate hikes don't necessarily shock the finance department or the bottom line. As a result, they typically have very strong balance sheets. They're known for their flexibility. REITs typically own rental properties that produce surplus cash flow. So that surplus cash flow can be used to refit, refurbish, and further redevelop existing properties, or it can sometimes be used to purchase new properties. As the units of the trust are publicly traded, the values can sometimes be out of sync with the underlying value of the properties. I believe that is the case these days. When units trade at a discount, the REIT can actually purchase units on behalf of unit holders, and it's sort of like having a business partner sell you their share for 70 or 80 cents on the dollar, if not lower. I'll wrap this section up with a quote from Sam Zell, who simply said, the genius of public REITs is that they turn bricks and mortar into transparent and predictable liquid assets. In this next part, I'm going to introduce you to some of the performance principles, some of the prospective partners, and some of the properties. But first, some wisdom from Warren Buffett. In 2013, Warren Buffett published an article entitled, What You Can Learn From My Real Estate Investments. I have copies in the link available if you'd like. In the article, Buffett explores the economics of purchasing a property in New York City with a number of partners. And while he didn't expect the results to be dramatic, he did expect the results to be satisfactory. Over time, his beliefs proved out. Annual distributions at the time of the writing exceeded the purchase price by 35%. Buffett's investment principles and strategy were straightforward. Number one, an investor preserves capital when investing in quality long-term assets like real estate or a great business. Number two, 
capital is protected when taxes, fees, and expenses and the effects of inflation are minimized. Buy to hold. Number three, capital and income compound as property values and rental rates increase over time. And number four, his capital deployment included long-term goals and objectives. He was thinking about his kids and his grandkids. This is a list of the presidents and the CEOs of the REITs in our portfolio. I've never met any of them in person, but I'm confident in their ability to manage the portfolios, or at least the properties. You see, they have way more writing on this than you or I do. REITs often require that their board members and management have a substantial stake in the underlying real estate investment trust. That way their interests are aligned with unit holders' interests, and they have a lot riding on the success of the underlying REIT. In this category, Mr. Coleus, the chairman and president of Boardwalk, is the champion. Now let's look at some of those REITs, starting with those focused on residential properties. Canadian Apartment Properties, or CAP REIT for short, is the largest landlord in Canada. They own some 17.5 billion worth of apartment assets in Canada, the Netherlands, and Ireland, and they draw monthly rental revenue from some 67,000 suites and mobile home pads. Boardwalk has some 200 properties, and they have an enterprise value of some $6.7 billion. Just under three quarters of their properties are located in Alberta and Saskatchewan, and they're currently trading well below historical norms. As the energy sector starts to revive, I would expect those properties to be in higher demand. And yes, Boardwalk derives their name from the Monopoly board game. The third company we're going to highlight is RioCan. RioCan is renowned for their urban intensification strategy. Their properties include a mix of office, commercial, and residential space, and they're typically located along transit corridors and main traffic arteries. Many retailers suffered during the pandemic, and as the landlord, RioCan was no exception. However, given their financial strength and their astute management team, proactive measures were taken, risks and losses were minimal. Having weathered the worst of the pandemic, RioCan and their tenants have adapted and emerged stronger and more responsive to the dynamic retail market. They make, about, they make up about 10% of our portfolio. Another large holding in the portfolio is Granite REIT. Granite REIT owns and operates about $8 billion worth of industrial and warehousing properties throughout North America and in Europe. Our portfolio also has exposure to modern office properties through Allied Properties REIT. Allied has about $8.4 billion worth of properties right now. Recent occupancy rates are currently hovering about 90%. That's a bit of a concern over the short term. But over the past 18 years, Allied Properties has seen assets grow from 9.45 per unit to about $50.92 per unit. And distributions have grown from $1.14 on an annual basis to about $1.75 per annual basis. It's why it pays to think long term. To sum up our portfolio, 33% is invested in retail, 25% is invested in residential, about 18% is invested in industrial, and about 7% is invested in office properties. Now let's look at valuations. This table compares the unit prices at the top five holdings on July 4th against the book values at the end of the first quarter of this year. It shows unit prices on the trust trading between 61 to 77 cents on the dollar. I don't know that those prices won't go down further, but I do know that anybody purchasing now and at those prices is receiving a discount. This table shows revenues and income streams from the top 10 holdings at the end of 2021. It shows the portfolio having an implied cap rate of just under 5%. But with rental income increases in 2022, this figure is likely higher right now, offering better valuations than what's available with bricks and mortar real estate these days. Earlier, I suggested REITs were taxed like a partnership. This table shows how the unit holders were taxed on their distributions based on the top 10 REITs in 2021. But just before your eyes glaze over, let me explain it this way. At the end of 2021, 
Unit holders of this portfolio were allocated a capital gain of about 3%. This in a year when their performance for the year was 30%. If your fund had been worth $100,000 at the end of the year, assuming a marginal tax rate of 38%, your tax liability would have been about $543.36, or about one half of 1%. Your taxes would have even been less if you had been in a lower tax bracket. Over the last 50 years, real estate in the Okanagan has grown at an average rate of about 6% per year. In the city of Toronto, the average rate of growth has been about 7% per year. In Canada-wide, I've read statistics that suggest it's been about 5% per year. I expect the long-term performance of the portfolio simply to reflect the broader Canadian real estate trends. Now let's discuss fees. This investment vehicle is an insurance equity investment. That means the asset is underwritten by a life insurer who guarantees a maturity value and a death benefit guarantee. Annual fees are roughly 2.5% of the portfolio's assets. That's less than what you'd pay a property manager if you held a bricks and mortar investment, and a property manager won't provide any guarantees. Now let's discuss what an investor actually receives in exchange for those fees. In Canada, any contract with a life insurance company has what lawyers call a testamentary consideration. That simply means a policy owner's instructions are binding beyond his or her lifetime. Where beneficiaries are named, proceeds from the contract are paid directly to them should the owner of the policy or the life measuring the policy not survive. When a person draws his or her last breath, a deemed disposition occurs. While you're negotiating with St. Peter, CRA freezes all your personal and estate assets until the probate process is completed. That process could take up to a year or two, and in some cases it's even longer. And it's a public process, open to anyone. When assets are held within an insurance equity investment contract, they bypass the probate process. Proceeds flow directly and confidentially to beneficiaries in about a week or two. No legal, administrative, or probate fees are charged. And note, in the province of BC, relatives can challenge your will under the Wills and Variation Act, but they can't challenge your insurance contract, especially if it's not public. There's more. The owner of a contract can designate whether a beneficiary receives funds as scheduled payments or one lump sum. They can designate alternate beneficiaries, and they can name something called a successor annuitant. That simply means the contract can continue by naming a successor and possibly deferring future tax obligations. There's one last benefit designed to safeguard your family's wealth and assets. In 1996, the Supreme Court of Canada conferred creditor protection status upon an insurance equity investment when A, it's governed by an insurance legislation, B, when a preferred class of beneficiary is named, and C, when there's no evidence of a fraudulent conveyance. That's a legal term, meaning an attempt to hide assets. Okay, that's a lot of information about insurance equity investments. So let's review those unique features. First, all assets held with an insurance contract receive a higher degree of creditor protection. Second, proceeds from a contract bypass probate in a plug court system. Third, assets are passed quickly and confidentially. Fourth, policy owners can name a beneficiary and alternate beneficiaries. Fifth, contract owners can designate how future funds are dispersed. And sixth, taxes can be deferred by naming a spouse as a successor annuitant. Got all that? Okay, ready for the quiz. So let's review. If your objective is to acquire and grow family wealth, owning a contracted portfolio of quality Canadian companies makes sense. There are several benefits and advantages to holding real estate assets inside a contract. If you can see yourself as one of the non-managing partners, we can take steps to preserve, protect, and propagate your capital for the long term and for the benefit of your family. If you reside in BC, Alberta, or Saskatchewan, and you're interested in buying in, you can contact me by email at gord at think-income.com or you can call me at 250-258-7045.
More information is also available at www.think-income.com. And if you enjoyed this presentation and found it informative, please give it a thumbs up just below the screen and consider viewing other presentations on the Think-Income YouTube channel. Thanks for watching, and please remember, stay safe, stay sage, and stay well.